Hi, I'm Marty Grizzani, and this is The Marty Grizzani Show. As a full-time real estate investor and business owner, I have a real fascination of finding the key principles for business success and personal development. This show is a reflection of my personal mission to find out what truly makes somebody successful in business and in life. We will find tools and tactics that they've used to reach those levels. If you're the type of person is not satisfied with average and you have a hunger for learning that will never cease, this show is for you. Welcome to the show. It's really nice talking to you because I saw a bunch of your videos and I've seen you were doing this really kind of before it was cool. I mean, really, yeah. I mean, a uh, hundred plus episodes of your own show. Yep. Uh, and, and I'm going to get into who this gentleman is in just a moment. But uh, I mean, I really think here's a couple of things, right? And we were just talking about our good friend, Charles Santoli. Shout out to CJ Santoli. Someday I'll get you on one of these, buddy. Talk about real estate and, and, and lawyerings and all the stuff that you do. But, uh, you know, truly, I believe you're probably one of the, arguably the most successful real estate office in, in New York. Uh, and then, of course, maybe even, you know, transactionally in the country. Uh, I love that you've done 100 plus episodes of your own show. Yeah. And, and, and really, what's really cool, I think the coolest thing, about you is being uh, one of the founders or board members of uh, IAC Kids. Yeah. And, uh, you know, and, and for those that don't know, that is a foundation here in Rochester where I believe 100% of the, the proceeds go to the actually the children in need, which is <laughs> unlike a lot of uh, those those types of things. Yeah. You know, the board gets cut. The person I'm talking to, guys, by the way, is Anthony Butera. Uh, Anthony, welcome to the show, my friend. No, I, I appreciate it. And, uh, you know, thanks for bringing up IAC Kids. You know, we, we started this organization 10 years ago with extremely modest aspirations, right? Uh, year one, our goal was to make 25, to raise $25,000. That was our goal, right? And um, just 10 years later, I mean, we have, um, we've contributed over 10 or over $5 million wow. in, in those 10 years. Yeah. That's sick. Um, it really is good. That's and, you know, sick. It, it's interesting because when we started it, uh, it began because we had a very close family friend who lost his child and he created awareness around the medical expenses during and after. Like, could you imagine losing a child and after you lose them, you're riddled with with medical bills like mm. it should happen. Right. And these are middle these are middle class people for the most part. Right. Who are working class people, I should say, because if you're working class and you have uh, insurance, those are the people that get tapped out financially. If you're receiving government assistance, if you could time your child to be ill, you'd want to be out uh, uh, collecting government assistance to um, to help pay the bills along the way. So what we do is we step in and we identify these families that fit our criteria when we work with the social work team at Gelisano Children's Medical Center, right? So they help us identify and we step in. Your typical family, um, either mom and dad have had, had, have had to pull themselves out of the workplace, income's at an all-time low, bills are at an all-time high, it's the recipe for disaster. And when 100% of their focus should be on their child's care, they have other things lingering, which is which is it's unfortunate. And we've, we found a way to close that gap. It's, it's really, really a great thing that you've done. It's actually very inspiring and uh, something that actually I, I inspire to do. So I, I really love it. I, I'm really yeah. a big fan of that. I mean, that after everything, right. I mean, if we can talk about the money and the transactions and all that stuff is great. It's really cool. But this is what, isn't this what's really important? A hundred percent. hundred percent. Right. Legacies are built off of what you, what you give, not what you get right at the end of the day, you, you get to a certain point in life where you start to think about legacies, right? I'm in my younger 40s, so uh, I've got plenty of life to live. And still, at the end of the day, when the money doesn't matter, right? Wealth is what you have when the money's not considered, right? Mm. So friends, family, and, and charitable contributions, that's that's where it's at. Uh, you know, you've said in a few of your shows and, and one of them I call, actually, I also want to just shout out to um, your partner there that's in a lot of a man, Cuso, very good. Oh, yeah, very geez. good, uh, actually. So uh, it, it, you guys have a really great relationship and you can just tell yeah. uh, that you do during the show. But, uh, you know, you said something that I think is so true. Why do people think that becoming an agent 
is a good idea. I really don't think it's that good of an idea. I, I mean, I really don't. I really think that you got to be a little nutty. Like, I think it's good for people who are high performers, who are maybe been, and I'll just throw it out there, maybe people that have been athletes, people that maybe yeah. served in the military, people who like are just, they, they want to get after it a bit. And I'm not saying that's for everybody. I'm not saying that's yeah. everybody, but it's it's probably the last thing that I would want to do if I was somebody that was, you know, just trying to get by. You got to be out of your mind. The statistics will tell you that you'd have to be out of your mind, right? When when over 90% of newly licensed agents don't renew their license that next year, that, you know, that speaks to the to the dropout rate. So your your chances are great and the reason why that is, right? Because it's still listen, it's an there's no other industry that requires such a little investment with no ceiling on your return. And um, if you don't have a track record for success in previous jobs, you better know that you have a high sense of urgency. And right, you, right, you have to be gritty. You have to have a high level of urgency. And you have to be willing to get deliberately uncomfortable if right. you're going to succeed. And um which, you know, which is I've, I've had to go through that and, you know, a little bit more background. So I have the Anthony Butera team that works under the Keller Williams umbrella. And I'm uh, I'm, I'm, a, I'm an owner of Keller Williams here in Rochester and in Buffalo with my business partner, Chuck Hilbert, who brought me, gave me a huge opportunity at the tail end of 2016 um, to come on board. You know, I had a really had a really good sweat equity opportunity. Because in all reality, I didn't have the funds to purchase into, um, you know, and we were we were big at that time, nothing compared to now. Um, and now between Rochester and Buffalo, and Keller Williams, we we have a thousand agents. It's it's a lot. That's amazing. Yeah. That's amazing. So it's, it's and, been and, a great journey. Well, I, you said something that uh, is really the theme of the show. You know, when I talk to whoever it is, they're, they're, they're urgent. That's like the theme of like... Uh, you got to have that. Like, that's like the missing piece for a lot of people. I feel like is that they're very whimsical about their day. Right. I look at a lot of agents and they're waiting for something to come across their desk. And I, and it's the same for, you know, cause as I am a, a real estate investor, you got to pound the phones and you got to love it. You got to actually love the not getting anywhere. Yeah. As hard right. as that is. I say it all the time, Marty, right? Like, um, and this was, I had the same mindset. You got to understand 10 years ago, I was swinging a hammer. I was a union sheet metal worker. I didn't know that. I didn't know your story. That's why I'm really yeah. excited to talk to you. I, I really don't know. Take me actually back to the beginning of like the entrepreneurship world for you. Yeah. So um was a terrible student in school, never went to college, right? Uh, I was a terror, I, you know, attention span of a three-year-old, right? <laughs> and I'm always moving, I'm always fidgety, and I never found my passion. So get out of high school, it's like, all right, I don't have a college degree. I just want to work. I uh, get into, you know, in um, an apprenticeship program where, you know, when I'm the summer of my senior year, I'm 17 years old. And when someone tells me after this apprenticeship, you're going to make $50,000 a year. I'm going to be rich. Yes. Right. And that's the mindset of a 17 year old. Yeah. Right. And, you know, and I, I worked in that for 12 years. I, I was, it was a union tin knocker for, for 12 years. Right. I fabricated sheet metal, welded, um, did installs, worked in the shops, which um, when you're 17, I was excited. It looked like fun. And then reality hits and the economy tumbles. And it's just interesting because, our market's changing right now. And not everyone's feeling the effects of it, but it's, it's, we're up, a recession is looming. Okay. Yep. Um, and my last year of doing, uh, of being in the union, all of the commercial work just went away in Rochester. And that's what we did was commercial work. Right. Mm. So everybody was pulling back. No one was spending money. I was running out of health benefits because I didn't have enough working hours because a union of 400 members never had more than 150 that were working for the my last two years that were in it. And when I started in 1999, um, there was an abundance of work. The economy was in much better shape. Um, so it, um, the, the, the journey, honestly, like I had enough of that. Right. And uh, now I'm like, wait a second, like I'm, I'm 31 
at this point, like I need to make a change here. But you know, the the, the scary part was I already owned a home. I had car payments, right? Mm. I had I had bills, and you're gonna laugh, but the journey started like this. Google businesses to get into with no college degree. Real wow. estate came up. Wow. I clicked, I clicked on that link. New York State 75 hour real estate pre-licensing course clicked on that link <laughs> right i didn't have the money at that time the course was five hundred dollars i didn't have the money to even pay for that course i had to ask my mother for the money to pay for that course and mind you she thought it was a terrible idea oh, along, no. with the, along with the rest of my friends and family i thought oh, it was geez. a terrible idea but you got to understand my path was unique in that I'm the middle of three boys, both my brothers, masters in business, right? So they were they were the massive success stories. And then there was the black sheep, Anthony, <laughs> who, who was doing construction. And to have, you know, I, 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 have, I have Sicilian immigrant parents, right? So um, that was something that um, wasn't okay for them. You needed to, they would tell me like, hey, my mom will never forget. She grabbed my hand and she saw that it was cut. It was stained. And then she grabbed my brother's hand, who was making 200 something thousand dollars a year. And she goes, hey, that's what $200,000 a year looks like. This is what 50 looks like. And oh. that moment, oh. I'll never. And you talk about Im like only immigrant parents say stuff like that. Yeah, it, right. <laughs> it, it crushed me. I bet. And yet um, I was so driven when I got into real estate. Um, the office I started at. I was the first one in the building and I it was turning the lights off at night, right? I was making the coffee and turning the lights off because I was 100% fear-based, which has changed today, right? Now it's, I have zero fear um, about what my future looks like. If the real estate in, it, um, industry collapsed, I now have a proven track record for success that um, will also work in any sales industry. That I know. And I find great comfort in that because if I lost everything today, I wouldn't lose a minute of sleep. And I know tomorrow I'm going to show up with more energy than I did today. I love that. I think that's super inspiring. I think a lot of people listening to that should rewind that because first of all, it's, it, there's some, there's some fun in there, but, but really it's you, you were able to take that moment and it's funny that you were able to take that moment and that's been like in your head still for this till this day. And it like drives you like that return on investment that your mom gave you for that license. Uh, I would say it's pretty good. Yeah. Uh, it, you know, but it's, it's just funny how that those little things can drive you. I remember the same thing. My parents would tell me like, you better make a lot of money, Marty, because you're very lazy. <laughs> I, I wouldn't clean my room or something like, so it's yeah. just the little things that stick with you. You're like, I'm not yeah. lazy. And then you just like want to, you know, get after it. Um, I, I, I really like that. That's really cool. So one of the, one of the things that I like to talk to people about is like, you, you mentioned it, if I lost it all, I, I would, I could get it back in, um, in, in through my sales experience. Did you have any sales experience before Zero. real estate? Zero. So Zero. it was just you getting on the phone. Like, what, what were you doing? Like, what was like, if you, for new agents that want to like get started or new, you know, real estate investors who are like, I want to make this happen. Like, yeah. was it literally just pounding the, pounding the phone? Was it just, what was yeah. it knocking on doors? They're not going to like what I'm going to say, because when they get into real estate and they realize it sounds a lot like work, a lot of them are just, they become disinterested in the industry. I literally had a laminated cheesy sheet of scripts that I would use, and my budget was zero. I couldn't afford to buy leads. I couldn't afford any of that stuff. I couldn't afford to advertise. I grew up in the town of Greece, so I was familiar with a lot of neighborhoods and streets, and had you know had many friends in in the town. So I literally would call the white pages with my <laughs> script. That's with amazing. my script, I made one hundred and fifty dollars. I'm, I'm sorry, I made one hundred and fifty contacts a day. Hey, Mr. Grisanti, my name is Anthony Butera. I'm with Blah 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 Real Estate. And um, listen, the reason I'm calling you today was because I have buyers that are looking specifically in your area. And I know you're probably not prepared to sell your home, but do you know of any neighbors that were? And over time, it started to work. Mm. My conversions were like, okay, now 
I'm turning a piece of business out of every hundred calls. My average sales, my average commission at that time was let's say two thousand dollars, right? Um, every time someone hung up on the phone on me, it was like to change twenty dollars next. But yeah, I had to have that mindset to keep me motivated, right? And the the issue with agents today is they want to hit the easy button and they're not willing to plow through the manure to get to the better days, right? And the other piece for me, what I realized over time is I always thought that something was waiting for me and I thought it was happiness. At the end, I'm going to be so happy when. Once I do this, I'm going to be happy because. And what I realized is if you find no joy in the process, you'll never find happiness, hmm. right? It's not waiting for you. It has to be a piece of your process. You have to get excited. I honestly, every day I wake up, I feel like there's so much opportunity. I, I get the same feeling like if you're walking into the casino with a thousand in cash, like I still get that feeling, right? That's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> that's You know what? I think a lot of that has to do with, and I, I think I can say this I from even just this quick 20 minutes of meeting you that- in order to get that right, in order to enjoy the process, you you have to be grateful though. Oh my God. Yeah. Right. So, so like I've, I, I was hearing this a lot. Like you got to enjoy the process. You got to enjoy the process. Like, no, I just want the fucking money. Yeah. Right. But what happened was I started to realize that I saw people with a lot of money. I worked at CGI and I, and I knew people who I was there yeah. for eight years and I did well and it was great. But the people that were really up there, right. The VPs and the presidents, the owners, some of them weren't so happy. Right. Yeah. And I was like, how, how is this, this person, you know, got it all. And then I realized I kind of found out it was like, cause it was, no one was like actually kind of grateful for, you know, and I wasn't, I wasn't being grateful. Like I wasn't being grateful for like what I had. So as soon as you make it about being grateful, would you agree with that? Like you have to be oh, grateful in order to enjoy the process. A hundred percent. And you have to have an abundant perspective because if not, you're always just going to exchange your time for money. And it's not a long-term healthy relationship, right? right? Um, and it's funny, you know, we're, we're on here and you, you, you talk uh, investments and like, that's why I'm enamored with passive income, right? I'm willing to do this today because I know that there's a pot of gold at the end of that rainbow, right? When you're just exchanging time for money, you stop enjoying what you're doing. And then like, let's be honest, as Americans compared to anybody anywhere else outside of, of North America, um, they wake up every day expecting everything to go wrong. So when something goes good, it's a great day. Mm. And as Americans, we wake up every single day expecting everything to go good. And when it doesn't, we don't know how to get through that adversity. Mm. So there's such a lack of adversity, right? And sometimes when agents get in the business, they've either had, they either have too much pain in that they're riddled with too much debt that, um, they're not going to be able to, to pay that and they get held back or, Johnny just graduated college. Mom and dad made life really cozy. Mm. Johnny doesn't know how to deal with this adversity because he always had the easy button of mom and dad. And now it's all on you, right? Was your adversity from growing up with having parents that were immigrants? Was that a lot of the adversity? They would put that on you a little bit or... So, you know, it, the adversity was watching my parents work. My father is still working today. He's on his 50th year at the Wegmans warehouse. It's amazing. My mother's been in the car business. She's she's a GM for um, Van Bortle Ford, right? She's been in the, in the car business for, for a long time. They, they used to own an Italian deli after they would get out of their 10, 12 hour days and go and close it up. And on the weekends, me and my brothers were in a back room with a black and white TV with three channels available. And we were just, we were surrounded by my parents always working. And we just thought that that was the path, mm, right? Because it was my parents' chosen path. But, you know, they've they've lived the American dream. They, they, they had no expectations from anybody other than the opportunity they wanted to give themselves, of course, for me and my two brothers. Right. So my parents are still like, my heroes will never change. It's really that. easy for me. I love that. You know, one of the things you talked about was when you started as an agent in, um, was it during the recession? Like 2006, oh, oh 2007? Yeah. It, it was, it was 2012. Oh, 2012. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. 
that's crazy to think about. Just that what doesn't seem very long ago, but it is. It's a, yeah. it's a, it's kind of a weird one. 2012. Yeah. It is. And if you told me in 2012 that in 2013, I was going to be a successful real estate agent. And if you told me in 2015 that in 2022, um, you're going to own uh, uh, Keller Williams in Rochester and Buffalo, I would have like, I would have told you you were nuts. And I would have thought I'm going to be so happy if and when. Mm, right. Mm. So now my world's completely different. In essence, I'm my team still still um, sells homes and a lot of them. And um, my days look different. Right. I have a full time listing uh, uh, agent. I have, I have a listing coordinator, director of operations, marketing, client care coordinator, transaction coordinator. What's changing in our industry is that it's becoming extremely difficult for the single agent to compete with the teams that have extreme bandwidth and, you know, can really create that four seasons experience during that transaction. Right. So teams have become a really hot topic and they've exploded. Right. And for me, um, I was a good solo agent and I was I was paid an ego, which is very common for real estate agents. They would they would rather get a trophy than be profitable. Oh. Right. And you fall victim to that, too. Like I was I was surrounded by agents, even my first year that were doing half the business I was and they're pulling up in a brand new Mercedes. They were so intrigued by giving off the perception they thought they needed to. Right. That it was never about the money for them. And many aren't in the business today. So um, but my day looks different in that I'm. First off, I'm in Buffalo three to four days a week, right? And I, Chuck Hilbert, he more he he oversees more of the Rochester offices now, and, and I'm in Buffalo. That was another opportunity um, that was given to me, and it all started from an opportunity that Chuck gave me, right? And um, there was a lot of trust that had to take place. And you know, I always tell people about Chuck. I would I would trust a handshake agreement with him. Than an ironclad contract with anybody else. That's huge. Right? And I'm I'm blessed with a wonderful business partner um, that has trusted me with a lot to the point where it makes me nervous at times because I'm still the idiot that barely squeaked through high school, <laughs> and all of my success truly has been through others. I have I have no control. Meaning, I never wanted. I didn't care about having control. The moment I could remove myself, I would do it. Right. Right. And I, I got to tell you that um, when it's just you, you create your own ceiling. You don't shatter that ceiling until you bring other talented people and every role that I have replaced myself in. They're all people that are way more talented than I am. Right. I, I, I feel like I'm pretty good at creating a safe environment where people love and respect me. And, um, that's been my blessing. It's really it, it has been success through others. And and talent can be, I've gotten lucky a couple of times with hires. And now our process is it's a career visioning process. There's personality assessments, like we really vet through. And I I, I have big talent in my world. Well, I wanted to ask you about that because it was, it was a conversation that came up today as I was meeting with an agent and an attorney, and we were trying to kind of talking a little bit. And I was saying that, and it sounds like you're on the same wavelength here is that do you trust people like a hundred percent until they give you a reason not to a hundred percent and i said the same thing and i and and i go and the reason is and i think again tell me if i'm wrong here but because i've won way more that way yeah a hundred percent when when they feel that i don't fully trust them you get indecision uh, indecision's worse than a bad decision. I'd rather you screw up and learn from it than have to come back to me every time you have to make a decision you're in fear of making wrong, right? right? All you do is take your job back when you create that environment. Right. Right? Absolutely. And and then I heard something that was even more, it, it made me feel even better about that decision of trusting people 100%, and maybe it will yeah. for you too. But basically I told the attorney, I go, well, I'm in a mastermind or two that people go, well, Marty, you just haven't been fucked yet. You just haven't been, um, <laughs> you just haven't been um, whatever. You haven't been sued or what all these things, right? And I'm like, okay, that's fair, I guess. I just hope that it doesn't happen to me. And then the, but then the attorney goes, 
Well, there's a, he goes, there was a correlation. So this is kind of a long story, but he goes, there was a correlation between there. Is, well, he actually said there's no correlation between uh, when a hospital or a doctor gets sued and medical malpractice. He goes, it's the doctors who don't give a good bedside manner. Those are the ones that typically get sued. Yeah. And he goes, so those people may have not been ones that trusted 100% and were very much like a, an abundant believer that everyone can win. Yeah. And that, you know, because it took some time to have those thoughts of like, you know, you, especially in this world now, Anthony, right? You're looking at Instagram, you see that, you know, you see all these people, you know, doing all these things and you go, geez, I'm, I'm fucking up. I'm, I'm not where I'm supposed to, so, so, supposed to be. You might feel those ways at certain times. Um, but in reality is that it, it's, if you just think about you and it's just my race and I'm the only one I got to, I, the only person I need to be better than is my yesterday Marty, right? Do you feel that same kind of way? Like, is that, is that resonate at all with you? So I am a natural optimist. With that being said, um, when my world was this big and I made a bad decision, the bad decision was that big, right? Now, when you bring people under your wing and they depend on you, it changes because that bad decision no longer only affects you. It's human nature to let yourself down than a stranger down. Wow. Right. And for me, my world has gotten to the point now where I could make a decision that could affect a thousand other people. Right. So I kind of had to turn into the black hat. I'll always be op I'll always be an optimist. And with that being said, before I make a decision, I go down the unintended consequences path. Mm. When not if this goes wrong, but when this goes wrong, how bad does that look? What does that look like? Right. And listen, there's there's an element I talk about it all the time of like when's enough enough? Because you get you know, you're this big and then you get this big and you torture yourself with why was I happier when I was this big mm. right? back to that same chasing happiness. It's never that because once you grow an organization to that many people, you're you're going to have lawsuits. You're going to have you become a target. Sure. Right. And it's like, why am I doing this? I got to have all these things lingering and and, and, and hovering over me. And, and don't get me wrong. I would not change my my life for for anything. I have been extremely blessed. And um, at the end of the day, I want to do what I want to do and not what I have to do. Right. And yet um, a lot of agents, they don't want to do they're not willing to do what they have to do. They want to just hit the easy button to do what they want to do. Right. So it's possible. And if you think that you're going to do it on your own, you're very mistaken. My first five years, I didn't hire one person. And um, it took me five years to hire my first admin. And when I felt the effects, within two months, I hired my second one. <laughs> right? And in that year, my business went from 19 million to 36 million. Maybe. And that was through, and that wasn't my decision. That was because I hired a coach and I pay for three coaches a month right now. I am $4,000 a month in coaches. I love that. Cause that's one of my questions is, you know, how much do you, you know, pay or how much do you spend every year on personal development? There you go. You're, you're, <laughs> you're $50,000 on personal development. And that's not even like, that's not even the other environments that I put myself in to learn. Right. And right. yeah, you and listen, you need someone else in your world that doesn't view things the way that you view things. And I'll tell you my first coaching call changed my world before the call. He said, Anthony, I want you to send me your uh, calendar. I want access to your calendar, gave him access to my calendar. And he called me and he said, Hey, what was this appointment? What was this appointment? What's that mean? And what's that mean? And I, 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 I shared that. We went back a week, a month, six months, a year. And he says, I'm going to call you back. Half hour later, he calls me back. He says, hey, I've got really good news. 
I am going to free up 40% of your schedule. All you have to do is hire somebody for $30,000 at this time, right? And that was really like, I needed him to say that. I never looked at it that way. I was, I was, he said, how much did you make last year? Okay, well, this at that time, maybe he said, you're worth $300 an hour. And yet 40% of your day is spent on minimum wage work. I was putting up sign writers. I was putting up lock boxes. I was chasing signatures, right? And it wasn't money. They weren't money-making activities, but I always viewed employees as an expense, not an investment. And there's no higher ROI than anything greater than talented human beings. That makes a ton of sense from your story previously about your parents and how hardworking they were. And I could see where, well, the harder I work, the more money I make. And that's not always the truth. And where it's like, you got to, as corny as it sounds, you got to work smarter. You know, you want to work smarter and harder, but you don't want to just work harder, right? Yeah. Um, So that's very interesting. And it's kind of hitting me right now pretty hard too because i ego and pride marty there's it's honestly if yeah you, if you can relieve yourself of ego and pride your world will open up because you're going to bring somebody else into it yeah that's really really good because it's another thing where it's like if you don't have to because you said this kind of earlier on it's like if when you said i'll trust people to do their job in a way it's in a way to me that sounds like if i don't have I don't necessarily have to get the credit yeah. and I'm happy with that. Right. Yeah. I'm, I, and it took me a little bit of time. I'm, I'm still not there, but I'm getting there yeah. where it's like, I don't need the credit. If, if I, if we are winning and I'm in, there's money coming in and then I don't need any credit who gets the credit. Right. Yeah. But it's still a mindset shift. And it sounds like you've had that, uh, you know, when you first had that first coaching call. And in all fairness, I'm a different person today. Then I was just, if, if you talked to me six years ago, you would have felt my ego. I would have been in a three piece custom suit. I'm in a Timberland. Hoodie. Well, you're from the West side anyway. And, yeah, exactly. So and, am I, so am I, I, I can say that. Yeah. And, and I'm in jeans. Right. And the moment I realized that nobody cared, nobody, nobody that you're truly trying to impress really cares. Right. right? And, um, and don't get me wrong when I would have, you know, when I would have appointments with people that I never met before and you're in a luxury home, like you, you still, you do have to dress the part. Um, and I wanted credit for everything. Titles were extremely important to me. And the moment I gave that up because I felt the negative repercussions, my world changed. And here's what I'll say, right? So in 2017, my team was in the pursuit to sell 300 homes, was never done in the area before. And we were chasing that number and we were so focused on that number that that year our business became so transactional and we hit that number. We sold 304 houses that year. And I'll never forget, and this is real estate in general, the the celebrations are short-lived, right? Bad days will linger, good days, right? Then it's like, well, what's next, right? right? Um, and I'll never forget the feeling I had. It was like, cool. We celebrated. We went out for drinks. And the next day it was like, I do not know if more than 25% of our clients this year would ever work with us again. We were so focused on transactions and I was so focused on getting big that the profit was secondary to getting big. Mm. And in that year, and you'll see the makeup of your typical sales team in real estate, because I've gone through it, I can pick their business apart. When, when you, when you do hundreds of transactions, let's just say, for example, you, you do 500 transactions and 400 of them are buy side transactions and only 100 are listings. I already know your business is broken and you're not making any money because you want to get big and you don't want to get profitable. You Mm. want that trophy. You don't want savings. You're more invested into your perception than you are your personal wealth, right? That, and I already know the game. 
You're spending thousands and thousands a month on leads. And because you have so much bought opportunity, you can't invest in the process. My world changed when I brought more talented onto the staff. I have five full-time employees just for the team, right? Wow. I have that client care coordinator, that, that person that's checking in your clients so we can proactively find more business and not have to react to the phone call that you feel like shit afterwards when they say, hey, Anthony, it's Marty. Hey, we're just checking in. I know we went under contract a month ago, but we haven't heard from you. Yeah, right. Right. And right. your mind is like, well, my job's over. You've got to talk to your loan officer and you got to talk to your attorneys. When you get that phone call, it's already too late. Right. I bet. It's already too late. Right. The trust is not as strong. 100%. If they have to call you and not yeah. the call, you know, you know, proactively, like you said, you're you're reacting. And that that can't be good. I, I do want to talk talk about this because I, I feel like, and this is my own thought. Yeah. I feel like there was never a better time to get into being an agent than in after the recession. I feel like something happened where you see all these people like blue, like you, you know, obviously, again, no discredit to your actual just absolute no. just being a beast and crushing it. But yeah. I felt like, wow, if you were gonna do it. There, there wow. may have never been a better time in our country's history than to become yeah. an agent in 2009, 10, 11, 12. Marty, there's, there's no industry that exists that has so much accidental success. <laughs> yeah, I'm one of them. Right? 100%. Um, and with, you know, and I guess what I'm getting at is I coach and consult agents that sell $10 million dollars in real estate a year, make hundreds of thousands of dollars a year that don't have a database. Yeah. I love that you can make hundreds of thousands of dollars accidentally. And I hate that you can make hundreds of thousands of dollars accidentally because now we're heading into a different recession. When I got in, we were still dealing with the hangover effects and uh, houses sat on the market. I think the average days in the market was almost 90 days at that time, right? Um, interest rates were super low, right? Historical lows at that time. And even if you had buyers that were credit worthy, gainfully employed, there was no consumer confidence, mm. right? Because they didn't know if their job was going to exist because the news every day was mass layoffs. Right. Right. So it was a different recession. And that's why I tell the agents that got through that recession, this is going to look different because we're in a rate increase environment, and yet the job outlook is still extremely positive, right? Um, and we're dealing with an inventory crisis right now, right? Two years ago, we thought it was an inventory crisis. Compared to last year at this time, inventory is down 25% when we were already dealing with no inventory, right? So it's the agents that can articulate an objection handle on why it's the right time to buy. And you have to be honest, right? You, it, It's not the right time for everybody, right? And yet, unless you're living in mom and dad's basement and you can stay there bill free, tell me how renting is the right choice for you. You're scared to purchase a home because the rates are 6.5%. Well, if you're renting, the rate's 100%. Right. It's great right? Point. <laughs> great point. Yeah. I don't, so, I don't think people talk about that. No. They, yeah, they, they don't. And um, times are interesting. We need listings, right? Because every listing has a 2x effect, right? It's going to sell to a buyer. There's two parties you can get off the, the table, right? So a year ago, the rates were a little over 3% for a 30-year mortgage. And every agent I talked to wanted another buyer like a hole in the head because they were one of 25 offers. And right. your only talent at that time was how strong your buyer's finances were and how far they were willing to stretch it. We were not in a skilled market. Now, we're heading into a market where the skilled agents are going to survive and the accidental successes, they're going to suffer.
that's pretty scary because I feel like there's a lot of accidental successes yeah. and thank God I've been able to learn. And I hope everybody else, like you just said, I think the number one thing is your CRM, right? You have yeah. to have a way to be able to follow up. Cause it's for us when we're buying something, cause we buy everything off market, it yeah. may be six, seven touches yeah. before we're finally getting that contract. Yep. So it's, yeah. And, and, and for the people who aren't willing to do that, don't even bother getting into real estate. And I think, and I think that probably just like everything else, and, 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 you know, it's, it's going to be good for, for the consumer or whatever, when there is a, um, when there, you know, unfortunately there, there's going to be the agents that are not agents probably after this yeah. next year. Right. Yeah. Um, same with real estate investors, just straight up. That's, you know, yeah. there's, I, cause I heard, you know, again, I'm, I'm still new in this game. I mean, it's 2015, but people talking about, listen, 2012, 2011, there wasn't anything called a fix and flip. Th yeah. That wasn't a term. Couldn't give a house away at that time. Right. Yeah, you couldn't. It was, it was extremely different than where we're at now. And we still, it's still a great time to sell, right? We just, the volatility we have had in our market, well, to put things into perspective, the average sales price has increased more in the last two years than it did the 20 years prior. It's insane. And we never felt that. Those were the sexy markets. That was Vegas at one time. Right. Phoenix. That was South Florida. Right. And we would hear these stories. And all of a sudden, we became that story. We had some of the hottest zip codes in the nation. Right. So it was it was new. It was different. And now everybody's begging for those buyers that they that they once didn't want. Right. Because right. Now buyers are the conduit to your success. So let me ask you this, because when, you know, looking at, you know, no one's got a better pulse than you right now. So because people have that three, four percent interest rate locked in for 30 years. Yeah. Why do they want to sell? In and move up to a 7% interest rate, right? Because so basically what I'm getting at is I'm feeling confident that the market's not going to crash like 2006 and seven and eight. That's why I'm, that's why I'm getting, that's what I'm getting at. Is yeah. that true or am I, am I off? A hundred percent, right? Um, 2006, seven, eight, it was the subprime mortgage. There were non-income verifications. I remember in 2007, um, I was making probably $40,000 a year. And I'll never forget going to M and T and getting approved for three hundred and fifty thousand dollars. And at twenty, you know, and it, I was extremely immature at that time. And it, like, someone else had to put me into check and say, if you bought that house for three hundred fifty thousand, you realize you could only afford it for like three months, right? That's bananas. So the, the difference now is the guidelines have changed so much that they've kind of protected us now. Are our values going to decrease more than potentially 5% in 2023 than 2022? And it may not decrease at all, but like, let's go worst case scenario. That's what that looks like. And it's not because the homes have been devalued. It's that these homes have been selling for emotional purchase amounts that you can't quantify. How do right. you quantify one of 50 buyers that stretch their emotions because their interest rate allowed them to? Right. 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 So we're not being devalued. We've just come back to one on one combat. They're no longer looking at 100 offers. They may be looking at two or they may be looking at one. Yeah, because as we're as we're pivoting into commercial with large multifamily and, yep. you know, self storage, all that stuff, they, the sellers haven't capitulated yet to the interest rates. And I think that probably is going to be the same with residential. It's going to be a little bit of time before, yeah. you know, that Zestimate still doesn't quite make sense yeah. to them. Right. Um, let me ask you this question. Cause then we'll get to the speed round. Yeah. You made, you talked about some good decisions, right? Um, yeah. Do you have a formula or a process? You said that now you have to, and maybe you answered it by, you have to take a little bit more time now because it's not just you in how it affects you. It's me and then my brand and a thousand employees. Yeah. Um, do you have a formula? Do you, is there maybe like something that you're really looking at when you're making a decision? Um, so decisions in general or like a formula in general of, of success? I would say a decision in general. I would just say like, um, or even, or even if you want to talk about if you've, Cause I also like to ask, you know, if there was a good decision, like what's, what was a good decision you've made recently or, or maybe even was there a bad decision? 
that you yeah, made. So that you- good decisions, easy for me. I've replaced myself with more talented people and we touched on that, right? Yeah. So my greatest decision was getting out of my own way. Yeah. I did not have a high lid. You know, that ceiling, I created that ceiling and thank God that just like you, we're born naturally lazy, right? <laughs> so I was never attached to the work. The moment I could afford to give it up, I yes. gave it up. Yes. And um, a bad decision that I have, well, think about a, 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 a bad decision that I have made. I think it was. Um, and that impacted you potentially. It, and maybe it, yeah, you were- I, I waited too long to make key hires. Mm. I was stuck in neutral for almost five years. And then when I hired talent, my trajectory, it hockey sticked. Right. What was that decision? Was that an admin? It was my first admin who's now my director of operations. It was that first hire. And when you find talented people, because here's this is me. Anecdotally, I need help. I just don't know with what. Where you find top talent, they will figure out how to help you. Yeah, because true. I couldn't even articulate what I needed. I just knew that I was burning from both ends. Hired my first coach, hired my first admin that same year. That changed that it would have without those two moves that I waited too long for. That was the bad decision. But without those two moves, I would probably still be in the same place as I was at that point. Right. And I struggle. I struggle really bad when there's no growth. I hate owning anything that has no growth. It doesn't sit well with me. And we're heading into a time where, in many aspects, I'm going to have ownership in businesses that will not see growth, right? And that's tough. And also, we're in a climate where the cost of living has never moved this fast in the past 40 years, right? Your people need to make more money while you're headed into times that you will likely make less money, right? So that's the hurdle today. If there was something that was keeping me up at night, that would be it, right? And I know in the end, because I have great perspective now, that everything that's going to happen to me is happening for me. Yes. So good. Right. So good. You, yep. You, um, you know, you, you, you also said this, but you didn't say this, which was like, you know, truly, you know, pressure really is a privilege, right? You know, as you were saying, you know, these, the things I'm thinking about at night and it's, but what a privilege, right? So that's why it's happening for me. No Uh, pressure, no diamonds, no pressure, no diamonds. So speed round, if there's a metric or only if there's only one metric that you could track in your business, you know, what would you choose? Or maybe it's something you look at daily, weekly, maybe something you look at monthly. Uh, What is that? It's lives impacted. Mm. That's my metric. How many people's lives have I improved since they joined me? It's really good. Um, What's the uh, book that you recommend for maybe it's an agent for, or maybe it's just businesses in general, for people who are starting a business or maybe what's the last book you read or is there a podcast you listen to or a YouTube channel you follow? Yeah. So I'll tell you that, uh, you know, if you're asking about uh, investments, the MREI, right? Millionaire Real Estate Investor, right? And also the Millionaire Real Estate Agent, the MREA, who happened to be written by Gary Keller, Right. Um, those two hands down. Now, if there's a book that I could tell anybody that they should read that uh, will impact them no matter what industry they're in, they may not even be a business owner. It's the one thing, right? What's that one thing that by succeeding at will impact the rest of your life, right? And it plays into the 80-20 principle. And after reading that, it'll be more of a 90-10 principle. You should be investing 90% of your time on the 10% that impacts everything else in your life. Super good. All And the one thing in the millionaire real estate investor and the millionaire real estate agent is all Gary Keller, right? Yeah. 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 Um, well, you, what do you do to intentionally network or mastermind with other business owners? Or, or, do you, or is, it, yeah. is it joining those coaching groups because you're going to be around other agents who are top tier people is like that? I was in two masterminds today. <laughs> Friday, I conduct three masterminds now. I have a top 20% mastermind that I do at 9 a.m. every Friday. 
And that's the top 20% producers in Rochester and Buffalo, which is really good because it ties them in and they can match faces with names and making a referral from one market to the other, which are neighboring markets. It, it, it's that much easier. Then at 1030, I'm actually starting a new mastermind this week that I'm going to be doing with Jason that we invited not just Keller Williams agents. We invited every single agent that's in our real estate board, right? Wow. You're talking 3,500 people, right? And because we, we feel obligated to do that because when I got in the business, you did a deal with someone, you got face-to-face -face multiple times. The, the average agent does a transaction today because the desired communication path seems to be text and email. They never see each other. They never have a conversation, right? So in an effort to bring people more together and improve maybe some per perceptions, because what happens in our industry is someone grows their business and they must be doing something shady, right? Because <laughs> sure. it's easier it's easier right. to look outward than inward, right? Right. Um, and I think that what they're going to realize is people continue to join is like, hey, they're not a bad person. Now that I know what their goals are, like it kind of makes sense. Right. So do that to bring the real estate community together, especially the times that we're heading into, um, because here's, here's the thing. Right. I started at a company, my first real estate brokerage, where nobody that was producing was willing to share. Right. Right. And out of fear that they had the secret recipe. Right. And I had that mindset because that was my environment. And then I come to Keller Williams and everybody's trying to share everything they're doing. And I wasn't the top agent at that time. And they're going, hey, do you need help with your PL? Do you need help with your with, with your vision board? Do you need help with your 135, your GPS for the business, your your um business planning? And I'm going, who are these weirdos? Mind your own business. <laughs> it clicked, right? Tony Robbins, if um if everybody actually listened to what he said and they implemented, his next arena would be empty. You have to give everything away to the 1% that's actually going to implement what you're sharing, right? And the ROI on that is going to be changing somebody else's life that can reflect at the time where you shared what you were doing and that changed the trajectory of their lives, right? So it plays back into to lives impacted. And if, if, you would have, if you would have told me five years ago that my days were going to be spent teaching classes and facilitating masterminds and giving it all away, I would have told you you were delusional, right? And it's, I, I, I'm... I'm happy to be, I'm blessed to be in the position I am. And for me, Marty, the moment I stop enjoying a process, I have to get out of it, right? If I had to show another home to another buyer, I would get out of the industry. I'm okay, I'm okay saying that because I have a team with people that Enjoy working with buyers. That's the conduit to their income and the conduit to their happiness, right? But what happened for me that was- That doesn't serve you any longer in the way, that, in the highest level you can, right? It, it, yeah. you, it could, it already did. It got you to this other level, but now the way that you're being fulfilled is by serving the agents that you want to get to the raise that, you know, that ocean and everybody kind of yeah. raises up, all ships raise up. I, I, I get it. And I understand now why having this conversation you are the successful business owner and the, the why the people want to work with you because it's, you told me your number one metric and I think people need to listen to that. And now it's a no brainer why someone would want to join your team. Oh, um, I appreciate that. Well, and you already kind of mentioned this, but not entirely. If you did lose it all today, right? Okay. And you did lose, you know, real estate did go to zero and whatever, you know, what would you do? I'd be thrilled at what I'm going to do next. I'd be thrilled and what the process is going to look like to get there. I'd be thrilled to watch something else start from nothing and watch it grow. Mm. Right. I love it. I love it. Anthony Butera. Thank you for being on the show, my friend. It was Thank a pleasure you, and uh, absolutely uh, uh, this, this has been fireworks. So thank you, sir. Awesome, buddy. Anytime. Thank you. We'll see you guys. That's Anthony Butera. See ya. Thank you for tuning into the Marty Grizzani Show. If you're listening on Apple Podcasts, leave us an honest rating and review. If you're on Spotify, make sure you follow us for weekly episodes.